God. We're so glad you're joining us to today's from Chicago Bible study. Today is 826-24, and we're looking forward to what God's going to do today. We bless you, and let's go ahead and pray and get right into the word. Father, tonight we bless you, and we thank you so much. Oh, how wonderful it is, Lord, to know that, Lord, you're ordering our steps. You guide us. You strengthen us. You help us, Lord. No matter what we're going through, we know, Lord God, that you're able to help us so that we can finish well, no matter what we start in. As long as you're the one that initiates it in our hearts and in our lives, then we know that it's all going to turn out good. So we bless you today, Father. We thank you for your Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us as we finish up this part here concerning the imagination and why you gave it to us as we look forward to finishing this up and going on to the next thing that you want for us. We bless you and we thank you for giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to comprehend and understand what the Spirit of God is saying to us. And for this, we give you praise and thanks. And those that are joining us and those that will join us later, we thank you for your kindness as they all, all receive what it is that you intend for them through this message today in Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Amen and amen. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and continue. You know, we were talking about how that uh, uh, we were looking at the purpose for why God gives us uh, gives us uh, wisdom and understanding, why he gives us an imagination. And he, we said to you that he gives it to us in order to create prosperity, wealth. And, and remember this, that's not our primary pursuit. Our pursuit is to do the will of God. And you can do the will of God with or without money. Remember that, that the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Come on, somebody. Don't despise the day of small beginnings because things start out that way sometimes. They'll start out small, but at the end of the day, you find out you have more than enough. You know, Sitas and I are, are giving things out, giving things away, sowing things. Uh, some things we're selling, others come by and they say, oh, how much do you want for that? We say, you know what? You know, you know what? Just God bless you. Take it with you. We, we can see that they don't have the resources for it, but they really want it. And we'll just bless them with it. But we found that we we arrived here. Uh, I said to them, we arrived here with just uh, our suitcases and a few little blessings. And and look, we have so much that we're having to give it away. You know, people are saying, how much, how much, how much do you want for this? How much? At the end of the day, after they tally it up, I just said, you know what? You just pray about it. Whatever you want to give us, fine. If you want to give it in payments, fine. If you don't want to give anything, that's fine too. God bless you. But we see that we have, we are leaving and we have an abundance that God gave us of good things. And we're happy to give them out. The two couches we had, nice couches, we gave them away to some students that needed them. And, you know, clothes that I have, uh, people gave me clothes left and right, nice clothes. I haven't even worn some of these beautiful jackets. And yet at the same time, I can't use them in the Philippines unless I'm going to, I'm going to use them to reduce weight by sweating it out over there. But the point is, God gives you prosperity. He gives you blessings. He gives you He gives you all these things. He gives you the things that you need. And then he gives you also the desires of your heart. So in this case here, when we talk about how God gives you the, the, the ability to, uh, the imagination to make wealth and get wealth, we also realize he gives us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And that's what we were looking at last time we were all together. That we stop, like I told you when the Lord says, stop wasting your time trying to raise money in America. I'm the same God in America, in Mexico, as I am here in America. So go back and go ahead and do what you need to do over there. I'll take care of the rest. And so we found that in Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5, it said, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. In other words, what you should be laboring for, as I told you last time, was to labor to obtain wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing, it said. And verse 5 says, will you set your eyes on that which has no eternal value, on that which is not? In other words, riches certainly will make themselves wings. And you know that to be true. Some people will be rich today and their, their, their money's gone tomorrow. Huh? <laughs> Somebody invested in this in this stock and they thought it was all good. Next thing you know what? Belly up and they're and now they're they're crying. That's right. So don't so set your eyes on things that don't have eternal value. Set your eyes on things that have eternal value. As they prayed for us at church yesterday, uh, 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 our final service that we attended with our congregation there, a, a family at Word of uh, uh, Fire Point. You know, uh, they, they just prayed for us. And, and the main thing was, Lord, thank you for giving us souls. That's what we're concerned about, because that's the heart of God, souls. We're going out there to, 
to win souls for Christ. But at the same time, our gift is also to be able to teach, to minister, to bring impartation, to bring manifestation. And so therefore, we're expecting not only to bring in a harvest, but to help develop the harvest that's already come in. I'll talk about that a little bit as we go on. So today's 8, 26, 24, let's continue where we left off. To create prosperity and wealth, God gives us what? Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Genesis chapter 12, familiar scripture to many of you. And as I said, this is our sign off for a while. We won't be back with you for about a month. But thank God for Dayspring Commission, who's already lined up some wonderful speakers to, uh, you know, to, that have our back while we're, we're making transition. And we'll look forward to signing on again once we get settled down there in the Philippines. Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. And so if you have your pens, papers, or don't forget, if you're watching us on YouTube, give it a like. And also go ahead and share it with others that they can also go ahead and and share with others and they can also come and join us and all of that helps us to get uh, get the, the algorithms going and it'll be a blessing to many others as well now the lord has said unto abraham god hasn't changed his name yet he's just introducing himself to him he said to abraham get thee out this is this is king jimmy king james get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred so get on leave the country you're at in iraq Get away from your relatives and from your father's house. So there's three things he says. You got to leave your country. You got to leave your relatives and you've got to leave your own father's house. When I looked at that, you might want to put in parenthesis somewhere or put in your notes. There's some things here that God is talking to you. And when God gives you instructions about something, he's always going to be number one, specific. Number two, he's looking for obedience. So notice what God said to him. He was specific. Leave your country, leave your kindred, leave your, leave your father's house. He's specific. And no, most of the time when God speaks to you to do something for him, he will be specific. Sometimes he will tell you something and you need to learn to hear his voice and be specific. And, and, and not only be specific, he'll be specific about it, but you need to learn to be obedient. I remember my, one time my mom went to a service with a, with a wonderful uh, ministry team uh, that, that was that came to the, to the uh, local church and uh, and at that time they the sister from the church uh, the, the sister from that team they were called the happy hunters for some of you that might might have been around at that time in the 70s 60s 70s 80s the happy hunters and they had a wonderful healing miracle service anointings and so uh, uh, I remember that um, it came time for, for the offering, and my mom, she was, now watch how God works. She felt impressed. It was a strong impression that it, it almost seemed like she could hear these words, give your wedding rings, give your wedding ring in the offering. Oh, wow. I mean, it was, it was a nice set of wedding rings. I'm telling you, and she was wanting to give it to one of my sisters for her wedding, you know, especially the engagement ring. And uh, and and mom, now remember now, mom, mom loved the Lord. I mean, she was born again when she was five years old. Spirit filled when she was twelve years old. She was healed of tuberculosis. They were going to cut off her lung and put her in a in a in a in a tank for the rest of her life and and the lord that night before the operation the next day gave her a new lung set of lungs she knew the power of god she loved god she never went out smoking drinking or chewing and running around with those that do she was a good girl but listen to me that day she overrode what was being spoken to her by the lord and she didn't do it and you know what Someone else picked up that word from the Lord and put their wedding, put her wedding rings in the offering. Well, Mrs. Hunter came up later and said, you know what? Normally we don't do this. We normally take whatever comes in the offering and, and if it's jewelry, we convert it to cash and we use it for the ministry. But the Lord said that he, someone put these wedding rings in the offering and the lord said to give them back he was just testing your heart to see if you would obey 
boy, that broke my mom's heart. She, I mean, she wept. She was broken. She knew she, she was the one that should have done it. And she vowed from that day, Lord, no matter what, I will never again, never again disobey your specific instructions. I will never put anything before you. And to the, her dying day, she never did. Never. So what do we find here? We find that the Lord said to Abraham, do these three things. He was specific and he expected obedience. And he said, I want you to leave your family, your house, your relatives, and go to the land that I will show you. So the other thing that you're going to learn here that we want to pick up, because we're talking about being blessed. You see, sometimes God is going to test you in, and try to help you to develop the hearing ear, write it down, and the seeing eye. These are two things. When I, we're not talking about the natural hearing ear or the natural seeing eye. We're talking about the ability to see what others cannot see by a supernatural grace that God gives you. Ability to hear what others cannot hear because of a supernatural grace of favor that the Holy Spirit gives you. So you're able to hear things like the voice of the Lord that says, do this. Sometimes he'll tell you, turn left, turn right. Don't go down this road to avoid an accident. Sometimes he'll let you see something that others don't see. And they'll, you'll pass by a piece of property and everybody says, that's a piece of junk. And they're, they're selling it cheap. I don't care. Nobody wants it. But the Lord says, I want you to buy it. But Lord, just buy it. And then you end up buying it. And, and all of a sudden, the realtors are all coming at you because that piece of property is now, you paid, you paid, you know, $8,000 for it. And now they're offering you 800,000 because this big project is coming and they need that piece of property right there. So you were able to see what others could not see, hear what others were not hearing, and you were able to move on it. Why am I saying this? Because you need to understand God wants to give you the power to get wealth and make wealth, and he gives you wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and he wants you to develop the hearing ear and the, the hearing ear and the seeing eye so that you can have an advantage to fulfill his purpose in the earth. Remember this, there are some that are called to go and do the job of the ministry, and there are those that are called to support them with gifts and abilities that they have. Uh, uh, and then there are those that are called to maintain the ministries through their through financial resources and ability. So God has three, three dimensions. Those that are called with a specific calling, those that are called as support team to support that minister in fulfilling his calling, and then those that are called to support financially that vision and that purpose and that calling. So there's three dimensions. Which one are you? That's what you need to find out, and then you need to focus on that so that you can develop yourself. If you're the one that's going to be like Romans chapter 12 says, it says, it says that there are those that are called to go ahead and, and finance then it says that you don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, Jesus said. But at the same time, Paul talks about the gift of liberality in Romans 12 in the King James. The gift of liberality means that you're someone who sponsors. You're someone that gives. You're a giver. You you hear about a project. God says, I want you to give to that. Lord, give 10,000. Sometimes he'll say, I remember one time. Uh, somebody, the Lord, the Lord said, give a hundred thousand to Dr. Summerall with that. Lord, yes, sir. And they wrote out a check. They said, turned to the wife and said, Lord said, a hundred thousand. Oh, yep. Go ahead. Write it out, dear. And they wrote it out happily. And then they turn around and, and they get a million dollar project. I'm just saying to you how God knows how not only to test you, but he will also bless you. Always remember that the enemy will come to tempt you to disobey God, but God will always come to test you so that he can take you to another level. Why am I saying this to you? I don't know, but somebody needs to hear it because you're about to come into something that God wants to make sure you understand that when the blessing comes to you, you need to understand whether whether the devil's going to come to test you or, the, or that the Lord is testing you to bring you to another place. Remember that the scripture says, what did Jesus say about what? If you're faithful in the little things, you'll be trusted with greater riches. So then, so then many times when God brings something into your life, what do you do with it? Do you make sure that you take that 10% and you give it to the Lord? Are you blessed or you release it or you do what you do with it? Or do you just go ahead and just keep that whole thing? And there's your test. God's not interested in money. Let me say this again. And God doesn't need your money, but it takes money. Yes or no? 
Okay, nobody's blinking at me, but I'm just telling you, it takes money. You know, we wouldn't be going to the Philippines unless somebody decided, hey, you know what? We're going to take up our resources and we're going to bless you. And they did. And they helped us to get our tickets. Without that, we wouldn't be going where we're going. But God had already said it's time to go. And when God says go, he'll make sure you get the dough. I don't see a thumbs up. I don't see a thumbs down. So everybody must be okay. I'm saying to you, God knows how to make it come to you because he knows that the system of this world operates with money. No amens. I better switch my... Uh, you're muted, sir. You're muted. So, yeah. Am I? Have I been muted all this time? Just for I've been one muted minute. All this time. One minute. My goodness, do I start from the beginning again? Okay, okay, let me get back. Where did I cut off? I, I cut off somewhere. I was talking around Genesis chapter 12. Amen? Verses 1, 2, and 3, I said, I said, the Lord said to Abraham, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house. I said, God is specific. Amen? He is specific, and he, he expects you to learn to be obedient. I said to you that there was a time when my mother, did I tell you about my mother? Okay, I told you about my mother. And so therefore you find that, that God is specific and he wants you to come to a place where you learn to be obedient so that he can take you to another level. I'm not talking about money because I'm talking about money. I'm talking about money because money is what, ca is what causes this world to go around. God knows that if he's going to do something, he listen to me. How could, how could we be able to help pastors over in the Philippines and around the world, helping them? So that they can fulfill their purpose if we're not going and taking money to help them. It takes money for, the, for us to support them. It takes money to help them when they're going through difficult times. It takes money to buy, uh, to buy the resources that help them to get through a typhoon and tight times and buy rice. Isn't that right, Pastor? That's right, Pastor Bert. That's right. So all this stuff. So what does God do? He has those that are called with the vision. He has those that are called to assist. The, the, the person with the vision as a team, and then he has those that are called to sponsor and finance the vision. Amen. So you have three dimensions. So Romans chapter 12 says that there is, Romans chapter 12 in the, in the King James, it says that there are those that have the ministry of liberality. The ministry of liberality means that they are those that are money people. Say amen, somebody. That might be you. Now, remember what I said to you, that Jesus said, if you are faithful with the little thing, you will be entrusted with greater riches. Did he say riches? Yes, he said riches. So the test comes because you find then that God will bring a test into your life, but the devil will bring a temptation into your life. The devil will come to test you. I mean, the devil will come to tempt you so that you don't take the resource that belongs to God and use it for God. There's nothing wrong with you enjoying life. There's nothing wrong with you enjoying money. Come on, somebody. God doesn't mind you having good things. He doesn't mind you taking a vacation. He doesn't mind you buying a little bling. What he wants is to make sure that you give him what belongs to him. And when he says give, you give. I said I'm not taking an offering. I'm just telling you the secret why some people have and some people don't. Some of y'all don't realize don't realize why we why why is it that we're having what we're having and why we're going. We're going not because we have money. We're going because every time we get money, we always release it. We're always giving. We get to Mozambique. We get over here. We give over there. We're doing something with our money that comes into our hands. We don't hold it like this. We hold it like this. And when it comes, our opportunity comes. Somebody just came in from Mexico. We released money to them. That money was for us. That was earmarked for us. But we said, no, you know, they came in and we know what it's like when you come to, to America and you don't have much money and you don't have sponsors and you don't have dollars. Here you go. They gave it to me. I just turned around and gave it to the person right there. I said, here you go, brother. God bless you. 
Did you hear what I said? You've got to learn how to be that way. And if you learn to be that way, you're going to find that more will come your way. You don't do it to get money. You do it to please God. And so here, God spoke to him and said, I want you to leave your kindred, leave your country, leave your father's house. God was specific. And there'll be times when God will come to you and he will be specific in what he wants you to do. And when he does, when he speaks to you, you've got to learn to say, yes, sir, and do it. And if you will, you'll find that he'll begin to start speaking to you more and begin to start using you more. He said, I want you to go to the land that I will show you. So here's the third thing I want you to catch here in verse 12. The, th the next thing I want you to catch is this. God is a God that speaks to you by revelation. You know, God will first tell you to do something, and then he'll show you afterwards the purpose. Notice he told him, I want you to go. I want you to leave. I want you to do this. And then he says, and then I want you to go to a land that I will reveal to you later. So he first wants you to take the step of faith. Is our God a God of faith? Yes, he expects us to learn to live by faith, for the just shall live by faith. And so, so he tells you and wants to see your reaction. And if you're willing to say, okay, Lord, without even knowing why you're doing it or, be, or what, then, then he'll show you later on why. He'll give you revelation. And this is the process of the kingdom that we are stepping into. When I teach, when I get to the Philippines and I teach on, on that Saturday morning, I hope you're going to be there because I'm supposed to be live, I think. Oh, but whatever the case may be, I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to be teaching on a powerful thing that's about to that hit the, the, the church. And that's on this thing about revelation. But I want you to notice there that revelation follows once you're willing to go ahead and say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Now, he says in verse two, and because of this, if you'll act on this, I will make, I will make, I will make of thee a great nation. nation. So now watch what happens here. Watch. Once you decide that you're going to go ahead and obey God, all of a sudden he says, now I'll add a little more revelation here. Here's what I'm going to do. I will make of thee a great nation. Somebody write down process. I will make of thee a great nation. Now I want you to notice the man has no babies. He has no children. But here God is already speaking of long term. Because God sees your act of obedience as a long-term investment. So watch what he says. I will make of you, here's the process. I will make of you, there's a process God's going to bring you through now because you decided to obey him. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. So you have the process. It begins and he says, in this process, I will bring forth, watch now, I will bless you, meaning, parenthesis, I will bring forth a manifestation of the process. In other words, I'm going to bring a promise to pass because you were willing to go ahead and go through the process. Somebody write down, trust the process. You need to understand that when God brought you into the kingdom, he brought you in the kingdom so that you could manifest the son of God in the earth. He wants Jesus to manifest through your life. But it takes a process of you crying, sighing, and dying. When pastor talked about how that, that Christ in us is the hope of glory, you need to remember it's a process for Christ to come out of you. Why? Because we have so much of us. We, you know, what did, what did he say? I must decrease. He must increase is what John the Baptist says. And it's a process to die to self because self does not like to die. We don't like it. We want our way or the highway. But I tell you what, here's the process. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. That's the manifestation of the process, of the promise, and make of you a great and make thy name great. So the long-term, listen, the long-term vision of God is to make of you a great nation. The short term is to make your name great. Did you hear what I said? Now you're going to learn, You, I hope you're going to learn this because I believe I'm, I'm speaking to potential ministers out there. You're going to find that when you first come into an engagement with the Lord and you begin to know him and you begin to go through the process of, 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 of learning the secret place, learning to die to self, learning to fall in love with Jesus, spending time with him. You go through seasons of fasting and praying and ministering to him. Then you're going to find that these little, these little 
uh, these little lightning shafts of healings and miracles begin to happen through you. God begins to use you. Uh, come on, somebody. Uh, and you'll begin to start getting a reputation in the church. Because when they when you pray for people, they start saying, oh, man, you prayed for me and something ha it happened. I got healed. Oh, man. you, I, uh, Yeah. She, she, I, I asked the Lord to, I asked her to agree with me in prayer and the Lord answered. You see, God's starting to give you little short term, making your name reputable. They're making your name great. You see what I'm saying? Why? Because he's already started the process of trying to make you a great nation. Meaning God is not limited in his calling to you to just limit that to you. He wants to touch you. He wants to touch your children. He wants to touch your children's children. He wants to touch your sphere of influence. He wants to do something more than just bless me, us four, and no more. No, he has long-term vision. I will make of thee a great nation long-term. I will bless thee. That's the manifestation in the process. And I will make your name great. That's the short term. And thou shalt be a blessing. That's the long term. And when you're gone, you leave legacy behind. Mommy Lily left legacy behind. The founder of, of Day Spring Commission. She left legacy behind. And that's what we're talking about here. I'll make your name great short term. And you shall be a blessing. Well, we know that that also refers to our Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham C. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 3, and I will bless them that bless you. You see, once you start understanding this, you don't have to go and harbor resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness because somebody offended you, something somebody did you wrong. You don't have to do any of that. When you understand the covenant that you have with God Almighty through Jesus Christ, he said, I will bless those that bless you. And I will curse those that curse you. You don't have to turn around and ask the Lord to do it. You don't even have to harbor anything. All you have to do is just say, you know what? I got somebody that said he'll take care of my enemies. If that's what you want to act towards me like, then, you know, all I can do is just pray that God will have mercy on you. That's it. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to say yay or nay about you. I leave it alone. Because you know what? They say sticks and stones may break my bones. No, I don't care what you say or what you do. All I know, as long as I keep my heart right and keep my attitude right, the God that I serve will continue to bless me. And no matter how much you try to hinder or stop that blessing, it cannot stop. Say all you want against me. God said, I will honor them that honor me. And I choose to honor him by not speaking against you or holding anything against you. Amen. I will bless them that bless you. And I will curse him that cursed thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Come on, write it down somewhere in big letters. Think legacy. Think legacy. Stop thinking so small. Come on, we're gonna we're gonna hit something now. We're gonna hit something now. The power of the imagination is what we're talking about. All right, to create what? To create prosperity. Now this is the next point. To create prosperity for what? We were talking about prosperity. To create prosperity for who? For our posterity. This is the next one. The power of the imagination. Remember, God gives you the imagination because that's where you get ideas. That's where you get ideas. And when you get an idea that's a God idea, remember Candy Copeland said, one thought from God can make you a millionaire overnight. Think hula hoop. The man thinks a hula hoop and made, became a millionaire all because he had a piece of plastic that he made a tube. And everybody's hula hooping. Who, who, who? Hello? All one idea from God can make you a millionaire overnight. The ability, the imagination, the power of the imagination to create prosperity for who? For your posterity. Don't think short term. And woo hoo, I'm getting a Ferrari. Woo, I'm moving into a penthouse. No, think long term. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 5 for now, in the New King James Version. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, 
New King James Version. You can follow in King Jimmy. You can watch the video later. Here we go. Verse 1. Every, I would underline every, every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe. Now, these are, when you read the Bible like this, these are things your pen should be underlining. Every, that's one I underline, commandment which I command you today, you must. This is the NI, this is the New King James. You must be careful to observe. Why? That you may, here we go now, here we're going to highlight, live, number one, and multiply. King James says increase, multiply, number three, and go in, and number four, and possess. The land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. So now we have four, four stages. Remember I said to you, the Living Bible Translation says, when the Lord brought them out of Egypt, he led them not directly to the promised land, but he led them forth in easy stages. Easy stages. How many know you don't go from kindergarten to high school? No, you go in easy stages because each stage is a learning process. Now, here he says, every command which I command you today, this is Moses speaking, uh, you must be careful to obey that you may, number one, live. Now, here, the word live here, it's different than bios because, you know, we could say, well, everybody, everybody live, everybody live, isn't that right? Everybody live, everybody's got bio, everybody's alive. But we're not talking about that kind of live. We're talking about we're talking about a, a, another stage of life. We're talking about a supernatural. We're talking about a zoe kind of life, the Greek word, the God kind of life. We're talking about a life that is connected to God. And so here he says, you must be careful that you might live. Why? Because remember that even under Old Testament, if you disobeyed and trespassed, you died. So you had to make sure that you obeyed the commandments and did what was right. And even if you sinned, you had to go and obey the commandment to take a lamb, take it to the priest. He would slay it in your, in your, uh, and present it on your behalf, and the, 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 lamb, the lamb would die in your place. So you, if you wanted to live, you had to obey the commandments. And so here he says, you must be careful to obey that you might, number one, live. The second thing God said is the next stage is, You've got to be able to multiply. That's the next thing God wants for you. God not only wants you to live, he wants you to multiply. How many How many enjoy increase? You should go read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, especially 2 Peter when he, saw, when he talks about their grace and peace be multiplied unto you. I said grace and peace be multiplied. God's not in the business of just adding. He wants to multiply. And so here he says, I want you to make sure you understand that the key for you to having success in life and, and moving out of the mundane Christianity is you're going to have to understand you've got to develop a level of obedience that goes beyond the general population at your church. Because if you're not careful, the people around you will become complacent and they will begin to start living a lifestyle that you think this is the standard of Christianity. And then you begin to imitate it and you never go any further and any deeper in your in your passion for God. And if you if you cease in your pursuit and passion for God, you will begin to start plateauing and you will go no further. And after a while, you will begin to find other things in life to begin to try to replace that passion that you were having. And the momentum stops and you begin to start replacing it with stuff. I'm talking to somebody out there. I remember this song that was written, and the lyric said this. It says, the stuff of earth competes for the allegiance I owe only to the giver of all good things. All this stuff on earth is, a, is, is what is competing for the allegiance that you and I only, 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 that you and I know only belongs to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's why you have to be careful who you're hanging around with. Because if they're not pursuing God with the same passion and they don't have the same love, I'm guaranteeing you, you'll be sitting hanging around with them doing the dumb stuff they're doing. And next thing you know, you're gravitating away from the kingdom and the, and the Lord that you love. So here he says, 
Be careful to observe that you may live. And then what? And multiply. And the third stage is go in. See, God wants you. God wants you to increase. And then he wants you to go to the next level. He wants you to enter into this promised land that he has for you. Now, here's the problem. You get born again. You live. You begin to multiply. You begin to see breakthroughs and changes. And then you begin to step into the thing that God has for you. But you never end up possessing it. See, most people will stop at entering, going in, but they never end up possessing what God had intended for them. And they never have God's best. So I want you to be understand. We're, listen to me. We're coming into 5785 right now. The Jewish calendar is about to shift from 5784. Remember I said to you, 578. Eight is the number. Pay is for the mouth. Remember, this is the decade. Right now, eight represents, in the Jewish calendar, eight represents the decade of the mouth. Remember, we started out with COVID. They covered the mouth. Don't sing. Cover your mouth in church, they said. The mouth, no more prophecies, no more, hello. Okay, so it's the, the decade of the mouth. It was five, seven, eight, one, two, three, four. In, in 2024, the decade of the mouth, it was what? Four. Four is the what? Is the number for door. So you have the year of the mouth, but there's also the year of the door. We said to you, it's the year of exiting the door is a point of entry and exiting and so we said to you 2024 is a pivotal year because you're about to exit out of this of this dumb year that we have been going through but this year of 2024 was was what i told you was going to end in a difficult difficult time it's like giving birth and and the baby stuck in the canal hello it's going to be hard. It's going to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to be one of those deliveries. Hello. Mm. Why? Because you're about to exit and leave behind all that stuff that you compromise with, all that stuff. And the Lord says, you better make sure you leave all that stuff behind because you're about to exit out of 5784 into 5785. And 5785 is, if you look at the symbol, it's the, it's the door, but you're exiting out and you're coming into contact with the symbol of the Holy Spirit, of the, of the breath of God. Oh, I wish you would get excited. I said you're about to step out the door and encounter the Holy Ghost, the power of God, the presence of God. It's about you're about to encounter supernatural. That's why the devil's fighting on every side. So many Christians not to not to give not to get prepared. Distracting them with politics, distracting them with, with, with money, distracting them with economy, distracting them with oh the war, and there might be shut up and get over that and get into the secret place and prepare your heart because we are about to exit and have an encounter with the spirit of God. But in that place of encountering, in that symbol of coming out of the door and coming into contact with the spirit of God is a space that is known as a place of difficulty. Difficulty that you're going to have to make your way to climb over to get into that place. That's why I'm telling you, don't don't, don't despair because you're feeling pushed back. Don't despair because things are coming at you that are, seem like they're trying to push back on you and holding you back and testings and difficulties and, and, and mindset and people. Don't, don't let that stuff get to you because this is now where you're pushing to get, get past that, to get to the encounter of the, of the Trinity, of the Spirit of God that's waiting you for you now in 5785 because he's going to empower you and you're going to see manifestations of glory in your life. There are trans, transform, transformation is about to take place as you come in contact with what God's about to release in 5785. Did you hear what I said? Woo! Be careful to observe it all that you may live Increase, multiply, go in, 
and possess. You're going to possess what? The land which your father, which the Lord swore to your fathers. In other words, you're going to possess the promise that God has for you. That's why one of the things that we have found that five, uh, that 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 this this year of the uh, 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 of the mouth was that there was a lot of the prophet, pro prophecy. You hardly hear prophecy in the church. You hardly have any real prophets coming to a local church. Thank God Marty was able to go to Pastor Bird's church and release a word. But you don't have a lot of pastors bringing in prophetic voices. Consequently, they have no hope. People have no hope. Because they're not having a prophetic voice speaking to them something. When we were over there in Decatur with Michelle, thank God, I mean, I prayed for some people and there was prophetic flow and I released some things. Right, right Michelle? Say hi, Michelle. Yeah, right. That's right. I mean, there was a prophetic flow there. I mean, I, I was amazed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Telling people they're going to Mexico and, that, and, and not even know anything. And, and next thing I know, they're saying, yeah, we were praying about that. We're going to Mexico. And, and the Lord told us we're going. And the Lord was speaking some things that was going to happen for them. Uh, that's prophetic flow. That's a, that's that You need to hear that voice that's confirming that what you're doing is on the right track. Amen. And so you find that, that you've got to be able to have those words of the Lord so that they maintain you on course. And you know that the word that God has given you, you're going to see it come to pass in your life. Amen? All right, let's look at the pattern. The pattern was live, multiply, go in, and possess. Are you ready? All right, I'll try to close with this. Here we go. Number one, here's the pattern that you might live. So first of all, you encountered God, right? You're born again. Well, how many know that once you get born again, and this is the this is the this is the difficult thing about, about Romans chapter 10. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. This is this is this is uh, this is this scripture here has done some damage to some people because they believe that as long as they do that, they're saved now. But how many know that being saved is a process? How many know that, yes, that's the initial, you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but how many know now you've got to go through a process of being discipled? Okay, if you don't believe me, you better go back to the Baptist church and ask them. I said, you've got to get discipled. So you're born again, and now you've got to get discipled. And that's where the first one, write disciple and put a, a hyphen and put live. Because it's not enough for you to be born again. You've got to learn how to live. Because the discipleship is showing you how to live the Christian life. In discipleship, you're going to learn the doctrines. And you're going to learn the parameters and the boundaries that will keep you in the favor of God, in the grace of God. And you begin to grow in the knowledge of God. Now, once you've developed in, in, in your discipling, then guess what? It's now time to what? To make disciples. This is the next stage. You begin to multiply. So number one, that you might live, get discipled. Two, multiply, make disciples. First you get discipled, then you make disciples. How many you know pastors... <laughs> How many know sheep make sheep? Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's right. So you'll, 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 get it, you'll get it later. Sheep make sheep. Huh? It's easy to make babies. I said it's easy to make babies. They're popping babies all over the, in the back of cars everywhere. <laughs> Hello, in the back of clubs. I'm just telling you. But but to but but to but to really make a family unit, come on, you're gonna need two people that are mature, understand what they're doing, are committed to one another, understand values, have boundaries, and know what they want to do when they have children, how to bring them up. You understand what I'm saying? So they get this, they get discipled, and then they're gonna make disciples. So the first one is you live, the second one is. You make disciples, you multiply. Now, here's the third one. Here's the third stage. Once you begin to multiply and make disciples, next stage is what? 
It's time now for the Holy Spirit to create through you a movement. Write it down somewhere. You create a movement. Holy Spirit creates a movement with a leader. So among you, he may choose you or he may choose someone that multiplied through your discipling, but he will pick a leader and that leader, he will give them a vision. He will give them a pattern and he creates a movement so that he can take in, <coughs> excuse me, the disciples that have now been multiplied. And now it can be a pastor. It can be a, an apostolic gift, whatever. But suddenly now you go from living to multiplying to taking in that group in to what it is that God has brought them together for. How many understand what I'm saying? When we were in the Philippines, we, uh, we, uh, we worked with a friend of ours who started a church there. And um, we worked with them. They started a Word of Grace Church. And, you know, if you don't understand why God gives you a, 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 a group of people to start a church, then you're in trouble right away. Remember that even with Moses, Moses had to go and spend time with God to get a pattern. I would write that down if I were you. Get the pattern. I mean, it's nice for you to go start a church and then go and study Young Cho, you know, the, the G12, you know, system to grow a church. That's how he grew his church. Multiplication by 12s. Start a group. When it grows to 12, split it. Start another group. You let that grow to 12, split it, and keep going and going. And that's how he reached over a million members. <laughs> okay? But listen, that's the pattern God gave him for his church. Because he went to the mountain and got the pattern. But if you go, there's no guarantee that it's going to work for you. Because that was for Korea. What you need to go as a leader is find out what the pattern is God wants for you and your ministry. Go to him so he can give you the pattern. Once you get the pattern, then you're able to go ahead and begin to start implementing it the way God showed you. And once you implement it, then you can go ahead and start experiencing success because it's the pattern God gave you. That's why I tell certain pastors, get to the mountain. Get your pattern for the next season of your life. Get in there and find out what God has for you next. Amen? Because if you don't, then you're going to end up becoming redundant, becoming boring, and, and you're going to start plateauing and you're start, going to start giving people the same old bread. And after a while, they just don't. It's, hello. So you, you go from disciple to disciple, discipling to, to a place where the Holy Spirit comes in now and says, raises up a leader for, to take that, that group so it, it can become, write it down, a territorial church. A territorial church. Your church as a pastor is not there just to entertain or just to hold together a group. It's supposed to be a territorial church. Meaning, once it's established, God has a purpose. And the purpose of that church is to take back territory. So now you need, listen, now you need God to give you strategies on how to win the neighborhood how to win the city, how to win the state. But you start out with your territory. Once you've trained your people to be territorially minded, then you can go ahead and start challenging the territorial spirits. Because remember, the reason why the hookers are on the street, the drug addicts are on the corner, the kids are messing up is because Territorial spirits moved in because nobody challenged them. But now you step in as a territorial church and you can begin to challenge and begin to take back territory. Remember what happened when Jesus went across the water, the demon came out, legion, and said, what are you doing in our territory? Basically, that's what they, that's what they said. He said, what have we to do with you, Jesus? What are you doing in our territory? Have you come to judges before the time? 
It's not time. What are you doing here? <laughs> when they realized, you know what? We're in trouble. They said, <clears throat> okay, listen, let's negotiate here. Do not, do not, watch now. Do not send us out of the territory. Did you hear what they said? Hear what he said? Do not send us out of the territory. Because spirits are territorial. See, I want you to understand, they have to go. They have to go. Once you show up and you understand that you have a right to take back the territory, they must give it up. They don't like to, but they will have to go. And when you command them to go, they got nowhere else to go because all the other territories are taken up by other demons. And so that Jesus said, when a spirit comes out, it wanders in dry places because it can't take other territory. All the territory on earth is taken up. So Jesus said, after a while, the spirit returns back. And guess what? It brings with it other spirits that were cast out that also lost their territory. And if it finds the house clean, it will come back into that person with seven more spirits worse than it. Why? Because once you cast it out of a territory, it can't go anywhere else except wander around in dry places. You have a power and a right to cast them out of your territory. Therefore, start in your house. Start with your family. Start where you are and then take it to your church and let your church begin to cast it out of their territory in their house, in their family. And then you begin to start using that and say, okay, let's take it out of your friends. Do you have any friends and family? Let's begin to practice this authority right and let's take it out of their territory. And then they get breakthroughs and they join your church and your church begins to grow and expands their territory. And little by little, changes begin to take place. Why? Because you went from disciple to discipling, to uh, taking a, a, a leadership position, getting downloads, and beginning to start take territory back. Amen? You begin to what? Possess. Come on, you take back. Why do you think God sent you to that city? Why do you think God sent you to that country? Why do you think God sent you to that group and that office? Because he wants to reclaim what the enemy has taken back. He has taken. It's time to possess, to claim back, to retake territory. Amen? Are you learning something tonight? Or is this too deep? Look at verse 2. After he tells them that this is your portion, this is what's yours, he says, and you shall remember. Okay, here's the process. Remember the process. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Come on. You don't become a superstar overnight. You're going through a process. You're learning how to use the weapons of your warfare. You're learning how to use the power of agreement, sisters and brother. You're learning how to work together. You should remember the process, in other words. I put, I put the process. You should remember that the Lord your God led you. Well, if somebody's leading, somebody learns how to yield and follow. How God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness, verse 2, to humble you. Here's the first stage, to humble you. Mm -hmm. To humble you for what? To humble you, I put in parentheses, for you to realize your limitations. Oh, I'd write that down if I were you. You know, God is going to take you through the process. You know why he takes you through difficult times? And why sometimes you wonder, God, why like this? He wants you to learn your limitations. Why is he doing that? So that you learn to lean, to trust, and to depend on him. We don't like it. We, I, we don't like it. But we got to go through it. He says, to humble you, in verse 2, and the second part says was, and test you. Notice it didn't say tempt you. God will never tempt you. The devil tempts you, but only God will test you. Read it in your Bible. God cannot tempt any man with sin. That's what it says in James. Read it yourself. 
But if any man is tempted, tested, he is tempted, tested of the Lord. God tests you, but he'll never tempt you. So look at what he says here. To, to humble you and test you. Mm -hmm. To know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. You know, the only thing God's interested in is you developing an obedient heart. Because he cannot work outside the parameters of obedience. Yes, thank you for that amen right there, sister. He cannot work outside the parameters of obedience. Why do you think the moment you sin, conviction comes from the Holy Spirit? Because he knows if you don't get back under the grace of God, you're open season for the devil. That's why the, even before you go to commit the sin, he's already telling you, don't do it. Don't do it. And once you do it, he doesn't leave you alone. He starts dealing with you. Repent. Get ready. Because he knows, man, you opened the gate for that devil. Verse 3. So he humbled you and tested you to see what was in your heart to whether you could keep his commandments. Verse 3. So he humbled you. And allowed you to go hungry. Anybody ever gone where the water went from here? <laughs> Come on, Lizzie. The water went from here to here. And everybody been to a place where the water went up to here? <laughs> huh? Everybody been ever been to a place like that? I mean, where you felt like, oh, you can't even say. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Look at what it says. So he humbled you and allowed you to go hungry. But he didn't leave you like that. And he fed you. He fed you with supernatural manna, which not even your fathers had ever tasted. Woo Why? Because he's trying to teach you something that you might, that he might make you to know. There's a lesson in every trial that he might make you to know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. But man lives by every word that proceeds. There's an S at the end of that proceed. That proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So your job is to find out what are the ways that God speaks. Because it says here, he humbles you, feeds you, because he wants you to know God, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So then the question would be, how does God speak to us? What are the ways God speaks to us? Well, we know he speaks to us through his word. We know he speaks to us through the pastor, the, the prophet, apostle, evangelist, teacher. We know he speaks to us through the visions. He speaks to us through dreams. He speaks to us through prophecy. He speaks to us through the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. He'll even speak to us through a donkey. What is his purpose of trying to communicate with us? He's trying to get us to learn to hear and discern his voice. Jesus said it this way. My sheep know my voice and they will not follow another. Come on, somebody. So we've got to learn how to discern the voice of God, the voice of our master. Look at verse four. We'll try to close now. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart. See, this is this is what you should be uh, this is what you should be gathering in your through your experiences. You should come to know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Yeah. You know? You know, and, and, and you know what? Come on, those of you that are mothers, when your little kid, when your little kid starts off and he messes up, you don't beat him with a rod and a pamalo. You don't beat him with a with a belt and a stick. No. But as they grow older, the punishment gets a little tougher. Come on. Come on. And that tells you this that as you continue your journey of maturity with the Lord. He'll begin to start dealing with you a little tougher than before. He'll do it with you, man. He'll convict you and his convictions will be harder. Not because he doesn't love you, but because he's going to show you a side of him that he, he's not messing around. 
It's not playing around. And that's why you'll find sometimes you'll, you'll feel that hard. Yeah, Lord. Yes, Lord. And it'll, you'll feel it deeper. He's not, he's not mad and going to throw you out with the bathwater. He's just letting you know. You know better than this. Now straighten it up. He's not going to punish you and put cancer on you. He's not going to do stupid stuff like that. Don't ever believe that. God can't do that. Matter of fact, when you read about Job, it wasn't God that put sickness on Job. It wasn't God that killed his children. It wasn't God that destroyed his prosperity. It was the devil that did all that. Because the Bible says every good gift comes from God. And anything that God touches can only live and produce life. So please don't believe all these lies that God puts sickness and disease and all this on you. Amen. All right. I'll go with the last verses here in Deuteronomy 8, 11. I won't go through 18, I, I, but you could read it yourself. Deuteronomy 8, it says 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you this day. Hmm? Lest when you have eaten and are full, verse 12, and have built goodly homes and dwell therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, see, if you begin to multiply spiritually and increase, you'll begin to multiply in other areas financially, uh, talent-wise, gifts-wise, and your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and gold multiply, and all that you have multiplies, verse 14, then be careful that your heart, uh, then your heart gets lifted up with pride, and you forget the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through this great and terrible wilderness, wherein was fiery serpents, scorpions, and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not did not experience that he might humble you and that he might prove you to do you good in your latter end. Come on, somebody stay with your hope. God is going to get better. It's going to get better. God's going to do me good in my latter end. Uh, verse 17. And be careful that you do not say in your heart, my power, my, my might, my connections. Uh, no, no, no. My brains. No, uh, no. And my might, the might of my hand have gotten my will. But you shall remember, underline and highlight as we close and we leave you for a month. But, but you shall remember, verse 18, the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you the power to get wealth, that he might establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Amen. Remember the Lord your God. He gives you the ability to succeed in life. God doesn't want you. Uh, what did you say? God does. Uh, what was that commercial? Uh, uh, American Express, because, because Americans don't just want to survive they want to succeed god doesn't want you to survive he wants you to succeed but he says put me first keep me first pursue after me get discipled and then begin to start discipling and then you take care of my kingdom i'll take care of yours and when i begin to bring you in and bless you don't forget me keep me before you i'll give you the wisdom you need the understanding and the knowledge and you'll begin to start doing great things for me so we bless you tonight as we move forward we pray that God will strengthen you and help you as you pursue after him because the imagination God gave you needs to be harnessed so that you can have what you need in order to move into this next season we're getting into, 5785. God wants you to be ready so that your mind is clean and you're ready to connect with the Holy Spirit as he downloads insights, direction, and instruction into your life and you'll be able to take the right steps at the right time with the right people, and begin to start experiencing the new thing God has for you. We bless you today in the name of the Most High God and in the name of Jesus Christ. Shalom, shalom, shalom to each and every one of you. God bless you. We love you. Amen.